Welcome back to Jump Scare. I'm Betty. And I'm Chad. This week we cover 1959's The Tangler. <laughs> I'm William Castle, and I feel obligated to warn you about the next attraction you will see at this theater. The picture is The Tingler, which I directed. And for the first time in motion picture history, members of the audience, including you, will actually play a part in the picture. You will feel some of the physical reactions, the shocking sensations experienced by the actors on the screen. I guarantee that The Tingler has more shocks per minute than my last film, The House on Haunted Hill. Don't be alarmed. You can protect yourself. When you see the picture, you will be told and remember the instruction how you can guard yourself from attack by the Tingler. And now may I show you a few scenes from the Tingler? This month is March, and it's Shad's birthday month. Yep. So I'm picking all the crazy movies that we're going to do for this month. And this one I picked because it was one of my mom's favorites. Uh, She actually saw it in the theaters, saw it with the special Percepto. Percepto. Which is a fancy word for a buzzer in your seat. (laughs) Yeah, but they placed in some of the theater chairs... And uh, would vibrate, activated with the on-screen action. Whenever people screamed in the movie, the seat would vibrate. Which I suppose is pretty cool. It's just a thing to deck this D-Box before they came out with D-Box motion seats. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, William Castle, who is a director of the film... He was known for this kind of stuff. He did lots of crazy stunts in his movies. He was a big gimmick guy. He did 13 Ghosts. Yeah, that was with the glasses you had to put on to try and see the ghost. Illusiono. Yeah. It was a handheld device. It would show you like blue and red and it would show the freaking ghosts and House on Haunted Hill, yeah, which had one... Emergio. That, he's big on O's. <laughs> That's the one where they flew the skeleton over, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I love that it was, they made it sound like it was so unique and it was just a skeleton they flew over the audience at some point. You know what? <laughs> I really enjoy the participation like that scene in like the scream 2 when they're doing the stab yeah when they're watching stab and they're having the people come out dressed up in the character and they're running around and there's crazy stuff happening that's so fun they did a friday the 13th showing here one time i can't remember which part it was but it was around this area and they had people in all black costumes that were randomly going around and scaring people during the movie they wouldn't do that now, of course, because somebody would get shot. But this was a few years back when you could still get away with that. Yeah. Well, Shad, I'm going to have you start us off. Well, let's talk about the people in the movie. And technically, there's other people in the movie, but the only person that really matters, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, they all matter, is Mr. Vincent Price. Yeah. He can carry any movie by himself. He doesn't really need anybody else, but... There's a few other actors in it, but I didn't recognize them from anything else. Did you? I did not, because I wasn't alive at the time of this, of the, in well, 1959. Neither was, neither was I. 
But you know, but we know Vincent Price yeah. because we've seen a, ma- a large majority of his films. Yeah, he's been in hundreds. How so. could you not know who Vincent Price is? I mean, depending on your age, but if you don't know who this is, look him up because he definitely has tons of films that you can watch. Yeah. I love the whole Edgar Allan Poe like series. Oh yeah, he did a ton of those also with Castle, and those were amazing. I love Mask of the Red Death. I think that's my favorite one. He's done, he did several, he did some that were like based on Lovecraft story, or they said they were based on Poe stories, but they were actually Lovecraft ones. I can't remember which one that was. Mm. One of them is actually a Lovecraft story, but they called it a Poe adaption because, well, why not? But this one is about the tingler that lives inside of all of us. Because Vincent Price is doing research. He's in, doing autopsies at the prison, actually, when it starts, and... I love how just a random guy just walks in and goes, oh, hey, this is my brother-in-law that you just executed. Can I watch the autopsy? And Vincent Price just literally says, uh, do you have a pass? Yeah, here it is. And he goes, oh, well, then okay. And he just watches the autopsy. He's like, well, try not to faint. And during the autopsy, he explains how, see, when you get so terrified, this thing starts to emerge in your spine. It's, it's like your spine is almost cracked, and I don't know why. Later on, he discovers, of course, there's a small creature that's in your spine that when you get scared, the more terrified you are, excuse me, the bigger this creature gets, the bigger the tingler gets. And if for some reason you can't scream, this thing will grow to gigantic sizes. But screaming releases the fear and stops the tingler from growing and kills it on its tracks. So, Or paral- we should say paralyze it. Yeah, it paralyzes it when it's outside. When it's inside, yeah. it just shrinks back down to tiny size when you scream. Okay. You got to get these fake science details right. <laughs> I, if you feel a tingle, the way to get relief is by screaming. The whole opening of this film is just explaining to you, like... Ooh. If you become really scared during this movie... Feel free to scream. It's fine. It might just save your life. Exactly. Yeah. I love the whole, like, I'm going to give you a story before you actually watch the movie. I'm talking to you as a concerned person for you, uh, the audience, and I'm going to tell you what you need to do in order to survive this. And they even at one point, like, black out the screen where the, the theater would be in complete blackness if you were watching this in the theater and say, ladies and gentlemen, the tingler is loose in this very theater. Scream, scream for your lives. That's my favorite part of the movie. Yeah, where they just encourage everyone to scream. But we jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah. So this guy who, of course, then is like, hey, uh, Doc, now that I've watched you do this autopsy, can you give me a ride back to town? Sure, why not? Oh, I want you here. Come on up. I live above the movie theater, the silent movie theater. Come up and have some coffee with me. Meet my wife. And I love how he introduces his wife. He just says, oh, this is my wife. She's deaf and dumb. Well, that's... Even back then, everyone else in the movie makes it a point when they describe her to say she's deaf and mute. She's deaf. She's a deaf mute. But he's like, she's deaf and dumb. Which later would explain everything you need to know about this character. Because he, spoiler alert, was not a good guy. He's not a nice guy. He's an asshole. And why did they... I mean, I guess obviously I know why they they decided to make her a deaf mute. Um, but she runs the silent theater. That's like a little ironic. Yeah. And I love how she's got the safe full of cash up there. Like this movie theater is making mad money back in 1959 because they have a safe just full of cash. I mean, we're talking about like full of cash. There was a ton of money and she's like gripping up. There's a point in the film, like right where, when Vincent Price is visiting her, she faints she has like a fainting spell because Vincent Price's character like gets, nicks his skin, nicks himself. Yeah, on like a cup he broke and he gets a little bit of blood and she just faints she, dead away. Yeah, she faints dead away. When she wakes up from the assaults, when she wakes up, her first instinct is, I gotta go check the cash. She goes and immediately <laughs> checks the money that she just put in the safe not even fucking like five minutes ago. But just to make sure that while she was knocked out, these motherfuckers didn't go over there and open the safe and steal all her money. Which is like, there's only two guys here. Fine, yes, grant you, Vincent Price is a stranger, but your husband is here. So what do you think about your husband? I, like, I have no idea why that needed to be a scene, Yeah, a part of the little... movie. 
But I love that like no one in this movie really has a stellar marriage because the 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 deaf woman that runs the theater and the guy that, you know, her husband, they're not real good either because all he wants to do is hang out with Vincent Price and drink beer and not be not be bothered with working. And when Vincent Price goes home, his lab assistant's girlfriend is also in the house. That's or it's his uh, sister in law, that's right. It's his sister in law. His sister in law's in the house and she's in a relationship with his lab assistant. And Vincent Price's wife is out with all these other men. And the sister-in-law even says, yeah, she goes out with a lot of men at night. And they're not very nice. Vincent Price is like, oh, well, you know, her husband sometimes falls asleep at the opera. Ha, 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 ha. I don't mind. Um, that's very forgiving of you, Vincent Price. But then when she comes home, his first thing that he does is meet her at the door with a gun and subject her to a fear experiment. He actually shoots her. Like, she thinks he shot her, but he just used blanks. She deserved to get shot. Isabel's her name. Isabel deserved it, okay? She was a see you next Tuesday. How dare you? Let me tell you, it's 1959. So this woman is freaking a daredevil in her time, okay? How the audacity. She's gonna be making out with some other dude in front of her house in like broad daylight or maybe it was evening it doesn't matter she's making out with someone that's not her husband okay such disrespect and because, it's 1959 he could have probably really shot her and got away with it yeah i mean that well that i'm not condoning that but that could have happened but i'm saying like how are you gonna do that fine he's a freaking scientist that's working a lot or whatever that doesn't mean that you're gonna go and you're gonna just freaking have an affair or be a whore she wasn't even having an affair she was just whoring around town to the point where even her sister knew she was whoring around everyone knew who didn't know what isabel it was like are you breathing because isabel's gonna have you in the bed like she was just about having <laughs> all she probably slept with the freaking had the conjugal visits at the damn prison where the man worked <laughs> because she was so available to everybody but I think it's because she didn't give three F's because she was of money and which they did not gloss over the fact she killed her dad. Like spoiler alert. She killed her dad for the money and Vincent Price knew what was up. He seemed to be okay with it. Weirdly enough. He was just like, well, I know you killed your dad and it'd be a real shame if someone dug him up and did an autopsy on him and found out you poisoned him. Yeah. Cause po that kind of poison just lasts in the body. It doesn't go away. But he was okay with it because she pointed out, I fucking pay for everything. I pay for this science lab you got. I pay for that lab coat. Okay, she paid for everything. So he's not going to be like, that's the money maker. So he's not going to be like, uh. That's yeah, he why left. also he probably isn't saying anything to her because it's like, I could just walk away right now with all my money. And then you're not going to be, you're going to be a poor scientist. But then again, it was 1959. If he divorced her, couldn't he have just taken all the money? No, he don't live. They didn't live in California, so no. <laughs> <laughs> she was not a nice person. She was a terrible person. I have a lot of bad things to say about Isabel. Her sister, on the other hand, super sweet. Love her. Yeah. Super sweet girl. And, well, he does the experiment with her where he terrifies her, making her think he's going to shoot her. And then he just fires at her. And she's so scared when he fires at her with the blank, she faints. Then he does x-rays over and goes, ah, her tingler was a, getting to be a pretty good size. Ew. Yeah. And then... I feel like they could have come up with another name besides a tingler. I understand it like tingles the spine. I get the concept, but it's just a... I mean, maybe I'm just a sick ass. I'm just so perverted. That's the first thing I think of. Yeah. And then I love how the lab assistant, when he tells him all this, Vincent Price is like, oh yeah. Hey, did you get that LSD I asked you to pick up at the pharmacy? And he says, well, yeah, sure, of course. And he just takes a box out of his coat and hands him the vial of LSD. And goes, be careful with it. That's really strong. I'm going to tell you right now, this LSD trip that he had is the tamest LSD trip. If it was that simple to be on LSD, I, I mean, everyone would be on well, it. Well, first of all, why would you do it? All he did was things got a little blurry and he thought the skeleton moved and he lost his shit. 
Oh, my favorite part was when he was like, the window, the windows have bars. I can't get out. Mind you, he, as he's saying this, he's opening the window and the cold air from outside is literally blasting him in his face. Like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, this is some strange LSD. And then he takes it, he screams, and it's like, well, I was hoping to see how the tingler would affect me, but well, I screamed. And he fainted. And he fainted, and then he's like, well... I had that LSD trip's been over for a good five minutes. I guess I'll just go check on that uh, woman and see how she's doing. I guess I'm going to drive this automobile over to, you know, the deaf lady's house. Because, you know, taking LSD, it wears off just that fast. Maybe I, he just got, like, a really terrible strand. Yeah, he didn't get a good batch of LSD, that's for sure, because I think anything... And he injected it, too. Like, Ooh, he shot it yeah, straight in his did. veins. I would think that would be even stronger, but... Apparently, from what I've read, LSD was still legal at this point. They didn't make it illegal for a few more years. So this was something... He's even reading like a book that's like the effects of LSD. <laughs> so uh, this was something apparently the writer had tried. Was he tried LSD? And maybe this was what his trip was like. I don't know. But they lead you to believe that Vincent Price is going over there to do something nefarious to this woman that's deaf because... He goes over and immediately is like, well, she's hysterical and she's upset. She's going to need to be asleep. Let me just reach in my bag where I put the LSD earlier and give her this injection. So they really lead you to believe that he's given her this LSD because when she wakes up, she has a really bad trip. She wakes up and she is seeing like crazed people with no mouth raising up out of the bed next to her with a knife. It looks like that the mask from the Twilight Zone, the one with the family, where they all wearing different masks. I forgot yeah. the name of that episode. But it but a mix of like the pig nose one. That's what it reminds me of, the pig nose mask. Yeah. And then there's like an ape arm that throws an axe at her from another room. Let me tell you, this ape arm throwing this axe, I mean, the axe was spot on. I mean, if she would have just been a hair, she would have been dead. I mean, let's just skip over she dies she dies of fright because in a what probably is one of the best scenes in the movie she goes into the bathroom and in this the whole movie is in black and white and when she goes into the bathroom the sink is running red blood and the bathtub is full of you know bright red blood yeah with stephen arm, king didn't invent the red blood coming out of the sink yeah with like an arm raising up out of the bathtub with a knife and it's a pretty intense effect because it's very shocking to watch this whole black and white movie and then suddenly that's in color. I was screaming in that part. I was like, oh my God, what is happening? I was like, is this in color? How is this in color? I was just like out of it. And apparently, according to what I've read, they the the whole that scene was actually filmed in color and spliced in with the black and white movie. But they just painted everything in the room, including the actress. They used makeup on her and put her in black and white clothing. To make it look like, to match up with it so that they didn't have to try and color anything manually. Yeah. And they just spliced this in at the last minute. That's why if you notice the film in that part looks drastically different than the rest of it. Yes, it does. You can, you definitely notice it. Uh, I was just like, it made it, for me, it made it seem like it was a dream sequence. Yeah. And that was the thing I kept asking is like, is she dreaming? Like, is she, act, is she just actually happening? Because it was very surreal. Yeah. So then, I love how this goes down. Literally, the guy shows up at Vincent Price's house with his wife and says, I need you to check on her. I found her in the bathroom, passed out. I think she might be dead. Vincent Price takes a stethoscope and goes, oh yeah, she's definitely dead. Yeah, that. The, I mean, I was kind of like, what is going on? He just, he's like, yeah, she's dead. She's, she's dead. I'm just like, it was so nonchalant. Like, it was just like, yeah, yep, yeah, she's dead. And, and then the guy, and then Vincent Price just sits down and goes, well, let me fill out some paperwork here. Um, did you notice anything different? <coughs> did you notice anything unusual about her before she died? And blah, blah, blah. Which and is like, he point, wasn't there. Her body just stands, like, lifts straight up off the bed. And he's like, um. She's you alive. Said, you said she was dead, right? Vincent Price is like, yeah, let me go check that again. No, she's definitely dead. Do you mind if I do a quick autopsy? And does the autopsy right there in his fucking office room where like, okay, back in the day, like if you guys had ever seen um, the blob, 
there's like a like an office like the doctor's office yeah you would have just like a random like he would just do like a random like quick checkup it was like a comp like not a couch but like the thing where you can like lay down yeah and you can whatever he does the autopsy okay quote unquote autopsy on this fucking thing he just puts up a little barricade he puts his coat on and he's like well i'm gonna open her back up so i can get the tinkler which is actually another favorite part of mine because I was like, no, when, you know, that whole effect where, like, you see him in shadow through the, like, little barrier that he's put up, and he's pulling the tingler out of her back, and you just see him pulling, like, this giant, like, worm thing Centipede-looking fucker, and I'm like, fuck no, and I, <laughs> my stupid ass goes to shed. We don't have it in our backs, do we? <laughs> <laughs> obviously i know that we don't but just the thought that something like that could be in your body freaks me the fuck out that's why i don't like body horror like it freaks me out and i love the fact that he did all this to her and then just wraps her back up in the sheet there's no blood there's nothing there's nothing and then the guy says well thanks for taking the tingler out of her doc um i'll just take her home now and he's like um i think you should probably i can call the funeral home they could just come pick her up no nah, like, nah. i don't want you to have to wait up for that i'll take her home and take her there in the morning sus okay super sus what are you talking about right now he acts like he's just i don't i don't even like he was just gonna go to like do some grocery shopping like, it was like a, not a big fucking deal it was he's just like in the back seat of the car at night while he goes I do love how realistic it was. It was realistic, but wasn't when he picks her up and she's stiff as a fucking board. It looks like he's carrying like, like there's under the sheet, there's just a plaque of wood. Yeah. Because she's so stiff. Like there's no arm that falls out. Like there's not, she's just a floating wood with a sheet over her. And there she gets escorted out of the door. I don't, I, I just, the, 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 the fucking movie was crazy. The part that I love is the movie theater scene because i can't even imagine being in the theater at this time let's say just before we go to that like the tingler of course gets loose in the movie theater before the movie's over oh yeah the tingler he comes out he's alive and um they're keeping him in this fucking cage he breaks out of the cage when vincent price is above the movie theater he busts his way out of the fucking box he's got him in and just crawls into the theater. And that's when everything gets crazy. Yeah, I, I can't even... I can't even imagine what that would have been like sitting in one of the... In the Percepto chair. Like, having this tingler, like, come out. Like, the, the all the lights go out. And you hear Vincent Price. And it's so funny because watching the film like vincent price in the film is with the husband in the theater like he's standing in the middle of the theater but when he when the lights get turned off and he's speaking it doesn't it sounds like vincent price recording yeah like it's recorded and it's not him in the movie saying the line it's very strange the it's way like they did he's that in your theater saying it yes and it's very cool like yeah. the to have that experience like your mom had that experience and that's a very cool thing yeah my mom saw this in the theater back in the when it first came out and besides the percepto she had the extra percepto of the fact that her and her friend that were seeing this in the movie there were two guys sitting behind them that apparently thought it would be really cool to just put their hands in their cups of their drink that they had and get their hands ice cold and then when all their screaming and the percepto started, they just reached up and put their hands on the back of my mom and her friend's neck. Which, of course, during the movie about the Tingler, scared the shit out of them. They almost ran through the movie screen trying to get out of the theater. So they got that theater got the extra percepto uh, experience on it. Yeah, for your mom. <laughs> which is pretty funny. Yeah, she said after that, she was like, ah, I made sure nobody sat behind me in the theater for a while. Yeah, that whole interaction is pretty neat, the way that they did that. I mean, the movie overall, it's okay. Like, the part that, I mean, I love, there's certain parts of the movie that I love. It's just, and I love the gimmick. The part that fucking pisses me off is, like, Vincent Price's wife literally, like, drugs him so he can freaking fall asleep. So she can let the freaking Tingler out to like attack him. And then ultimately obviously kill him. Because that was her main thing right. She was trying to get away from Vincent Price. Yeah. It does so. And then 
The only reason he survives is because his sister-in-law comes home and screams and paralyzes. Saves his life. Yeah, and then they never mention the sister again. Vincent Price is just like, well, she's a bitch, I guess. The wife disappears. Like, no, the wife, the sister the next day, she comes in and she's like, um, Isabel is gone. Lucy is her name. Lucy comes in. She goes, Isabel's gone. Or her clothes are gone. But she's never talked about or said about Ed for the rest of the film. Neither is Lucy. Like, they're totally gone. Like, what is going on? The movie kind of just abruptly, I feel like it just ends. Like, yeah, it's kind of like after they, you know, after they eventually catch the tingler. That's just it. It's like, well, that's the end. Literally. that It was like, we ran out of ideas. The, the main freaking, like, thing of the movie's gone. The gimmick is over. Now we're left with these things. It's, you know what I've noticed? A, a lot of these, there was another movie we watched, a black and white movie, where it just abruptly ended. I, I just feel like that was, like, a thing back then. Like, the movies that were not very popular movies, I mean, obviously, for obvious reasons, they just ended. And, and I'm not saying, like, oh, it's a natural ending. Like, Vincent Price tells the freaking husband that he has to turn himself in because he killed her and then he's like well you're gonna do this and vincent price pulls the gun out and is like obviously protecting himself because you know this guy's freaking shady or whatever and then he like he's like you're gonna call the police and oh, no, turn yourself in the, the guy pulls the gun out on vincent price oh yes 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 he but pulls then the gun out and vincent price is like you're not gonna shoot me oh and yeah he turns his back on him and walks out the door and says Look, I'm just going to go downstairs and call the cops if you don't. And I'm thinking, okay, Vincent Price, why wouldn't he just shoot you in the back and then leave? I don't know, but he doesn't. Yeah, he, he just stands there and then the movie ends. That's it. We well, don't. there's some other stuff that happens. We won't necessarily spoil that. But yeah, it's over immediately after that and there's no explanation as to what happened. There is no explanation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's no explanation. Just some weird stuff happens after that. And then there's no explanation as to how or why. I'm trying to remember in the, in the ending of House on Haunted Hill. I think also the movie ends kind of like on the same note where it just it's like, okay, this happened and in the end. Like, yeah. bye. <laughs> I've, I've shown you what I want to show you and therefore get the fuck out. I'm sure they probably just had like a, a contracted time. It has to be at least 80 minutes and we've hit the 80 minute mark. So we're done. Vincent Price was like, look, I got to go to my next job. Um, I'm gone. Which is probably the same studio. He just had to walk over to the next building. Yeah, I have to go to the next. I have to go to the next building. We're filming uh, Thirteen Ghosts. There, gotta go. <laughs> have to get right into it. Then there. Oh well. Lo and behold, there's William Castle again. He's doing both. Yeah, because these movies. I mean, uh, it's. I think it's House on Haunted Hill came out like in 1960. These films were like filmed pretty close together. Yeah, well, back in the day, they would crank out tons of movies like that. You know. Now these these good, like directors make like one movie every three years. Those guys made like three movies in a month. They cranked them out because they're owned by the damn freaking um, houses, like the studios. studios. And the studios, they, I mean, they, they wanted movies. They were intense. Like the actors had contracts for that specific studio, and you couldn't do any other movie if it wasn't with that studio. And the studio literally had your ass by the balls. Like they're like, okay, we're gonna need a copper film, we're gonna need a western, and we're gonna need a musical. Bang, bang, bang. You yep. know. They would just crank them out like that. That's why there's so many of those cat, like a William Castle box set would be huge. Yeah, it would be huge. But and very, you know, I feel like for those movies, it's kind of lost because you don't really get to have the full experience. Yeah, that's why I kind of like that movie Popcorn, where they're recreating like the crazy effect in that movie. They've yes. got like the giant moth flying overhead and everything. I would love to go see one of these where they recreate that. Even as cheesy as it is, if they did the Percepto where they just dragged the skeleton across the movie theater, that would be hilarious to see. That would be the Illusiono. Oh, Illusiono, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got to get the right the right ones. The right O? Yeah. Percepto, Emergio, what was the other one? Percepto, Illusiono, Illusiono Emergio. Emergio. Yeah, there's all kinds of O's in there. But yeah, well, Something he, is emerging, there's an illusion, ah. and your perception is going to be tested. So this is kind of like what they do. Did you ever do the Shrek uh, theater at Universal where they have like the, yes. light, the spiders that run across the theater and they have like the air jets that go across your feet? Yes. That's the closest thing we've got to this kind of thing now. That was like that freaking um, Tomorrowland uh, in Disney. There was a ride, an alien 
Oh, right, yeah. that they shut down. It was the scariest fucking ride, okay? I, 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 I'm not going to say a ride. I would that say more Mission like Earth an experience. I don't know. It's on Mission Earth. It's like... Where you were going to Mars or something? No, no, no. You would be sitting in these chairs, and the chairs were huge. Like, and... An alien fucking showed up. I don't remember, mind you, literally I like participated in this at this time frame. It was like probably mid 90s, okay? The alien fucking, they were like, oh, the alien's coming or whatever. And it would breathe on your fucking neck because the seats were so big because they had all this like tech involved in it where okay. it would blow breath like air on you or and it did some other bullshit to you and it felt like that motherfucker was right there it was very scary i think it was hands down besides like the michael jackson epcot center uh roller coaster thing that scared the shit out of me when i was a little girl um what's that captain eo yeah i don't like i didn't like that at all that was really scary but besides that this was the second like creepiest ride disney ever had yeah, I was like the Terminator 3D thing where they did all the effects in the audience like that. That's the closest things we've had to that in a long time. And I wish they would do more of that in theaters. It'd be really cool. It would. I mean, the last time I had that um, that experience was when I went to go see the second Hobbit movie where they had the chairs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where you would go down the mine and you would be. it would feel like you were going down the mine. It wasn't the whole movie. It was just like parts of some it. parts of it. Yeah, I wish they'd do some more horror movies like that because I really, it would be cool to see that. Uh, extra terrestrial ah, okay. ride. Yeah, that's, yeah. Mid-90s, like 1994. Yeah, what the freak, man. Alien encounter experience, right? That, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. And you know, I, I, I am not... I know you're not into aliens, so I, I am, that was extra terrifying for No, you. I was not. I was creeped the F out. But yeah, I like when there's a mix of like the film and an experience and i wish they would do more of that i understand I, it was a d box i think that's what you yeah. had mentioned earlier and why it, it does cost more to have like that experience and like not every film was gonna be able to have that but it would be cool like james cameron's new avatar that would be something really freaking amazing to have yeah like, even if the movie's not good the experience might be good like can i feel like i'm like you know, that scene in like Harry Potter when I have to go underwater and I have like the, I have the gillyweed, you know, can I be like in a bubble? I know you don't understand anything I'm saying <laughs> right now, but like, can I have like a bubble? Like when I'm under, I want to feel like I'm literally in the water with James Cameron, that not with him, but much. that's the kind of experience I need for this new Avatar movie. I need to be, I need to feel like I'm in this water world, not the Kevin Costner film. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would give this one three knives just based on the, the fun of it. Uh, it. It's not the greatest movie, but it's a lot of fun. I give it three knives because of the experience. And also, it was really neat to see the uh, the whole black and white scene, hands down. I mean, yeah, it's it's a gimmick. like, But it's really cool to see, you know, what you had to do back in the day in order to get people to be you know scared or to have that kind of experience because yeah. it had never been done before you know yeah now they would just if the movie was in black and white they would just color this one spot red and that would be that yeah they just mean, digitally fix it and it would take two seconds imagine a time in film where like the majority of the films were either like gangster films or like westerns like that's yeah. boring i mean like you could only see so many westerns you yeah. know and when you start to have like the horror element to it, it really opens up another door and, and another experience for the audience. And it's really neat, you know, that they were able to do that. And that Willing Castle was so gimmicky. Because I would totally watch those movies in the theater. If they were having a Tangler or a uh, Haunted Hill or 13 Ghosts, and I can have the Emergio, the Illusiono, the Percepto yep. I'd experience. Go see that in a I would totally freaking do it because it would make the be the movie so much, you know, better overall. I also give it three knives. Well, Shad, this is your first film for the month. And we dedicate this, uh, this episode to Shad's mom, whose birthday is on Friday. 
Um, so this one's for you, JD. We love you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for listening, everyone. We appreciate you listening to the start of the birthday month. Stay tuned to the horror.